you will, you guys can turn back in your Bibles to James chapter 4. James chapter 4, if you will. If you don't have a Bible, you do have your pastor's commentary and your outline as we prepare to consider the message before us today. Did our, did our brothers do an outstanding job of cooking? So we have been doing Heather Farms Park for a good 15, 16, 17 years. And for the first eight or nine of them, I was the one holding the court down. <laughs> just, I just want you to know right now. Okay. And I graciously passed the baton to that younger brother you just saw right there. I went into retirement not because I had to, but I just thought it would be better. And I transitioned to cooking. This is why you hear me speaking so consistently and favorably and auspiciously about food. And uh, I was want to make sure that my brothers took care of you guys today. And I was so glad to see how diligent they were in that task. There was a, there was a second ulterior motive that they didn't know that I was accomplishing by way of uh, testing. And that is they have no excuse now for not cooking at home for their wives and giving them a break from time to time. That's a done deal. That's a wrap. They can do that. So uh, have you ever been in a situation where a friend or a colleague, or if we would retain the sports analogy, a teammate uh, with whom you were bound by that particular sphere of purpose to work together and to achieve the goal of winning the game or accomplishing the task at work and uh, meeting uh, goals and meeting agendas and, and basically succeeding. Have you ever been in a situation where people around you who were ostensibly your teammates, your fellow compadres, your uh, fellow laborers, and, and then all of a sudden you discovered something. It was a mystery. It wasn't really clear to you, but there began to be a conflict between you and them. It was, just something happened where all of a sudden there was kind of a adverse atmosphere that began to emerge between you and them and them and you. Now, just because you're church folk, I'm not going to put you on the negative side. I'm going to frame this in a way in which it happened to you, but it's very possible that you did this to them. But, but I want to set the context for us to understand the fourth chapter of James, because James, like sort of a, a, a stethoscope as well as, as a magnifying glass, as one of those cameras that can widen the lens, He's opening up for us uh, chapter 4 in a way in which he is really covering chapters 1, 2, and 3. So if you haven't really heard 1, 2, and 3, this is going to be tough. That's why I'm laying the foundation now on a practical level to just get you psychologically and emotionally ready for what we're dealing with. If you have ever had a situation where you were working with a group of people or being or living or abiding with a group of people where it was assumed they were on your side, and then all of a sudden the circumstances told you something different. You felt something different. It was opposite of what it should have been. And then all of a sudden you are in this conflict mode with these people. And you're going, what is this about? Right? Because on the surface, you're supposed to be on the same team. On paper, you work for the same company. In terms of protocol and agenda, you guys are supposed to be headed in the same direction. You have the same trajectory, supposedly. But inside, you know something is wrong, don't you? Inside. It's a mystery. It's a struggle. But you know something is wrong. Now, the picture that I have painted can serve in any context you want to, right? It can serve on the job. It can serve at school. It can serve in a sports arena. It can serve in marriage. And it certainly can serve in the church. 
James is actually going to open this whole scenario up for us in chapter 4 as he deals with what he has assessed now for four chapters, a real problem in the church that he was ministering to. to. And you guys know we have already assessed that James has uh, begun to minister to the general congregation of the Jewish people who have come out of Judaism into Christianity. But as we have learned, they've brought a lot of baggage from Judaism into the Christian church. And one of the main pieces of baggage they brought in was debating and arguing with one another and striving and walking in conflict with one another and seeking the upper hand so much so that they were willing to oppress the poor in order to advantage themselves. And I think I've told you before, if you don't get this, the book of James is nothing other than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John analyzed. Because the gospel is all about Jesus being afflicted and assaulted and constantly harassed by the people who should have been on his team by the people with whom he should have been on the same page, going down the same course, achieving the same goals. And every time he turns around, he's in a war. He's in a fight. He's in a battle. He's in a conflict. You understand what I'm saying now? And so the title of our message is going to be a little bit evasive, but it will help us understand the connection between chapter 3 and chapter 4. The title of our message is, Behold, he what? Conflict between the what? Wheat and the tares. Now what's the connection? Acts chapter 9 verse 11 gives us a description of a man whose life was radically changed. But a man who formerly to this physical disposition of being on his knees and calling out to God was very much like the people of Jesus' day. At war, fighting, persecuting, hunting down Christians. Isn't this funny how God works? One day you can be against God and the next day he'll have you on your knees. Isn't that funny how it works? And here this brother is described as being on a street called straight. Now we call that the gospel way, right? We call that Christ and him crucified, right? Until you get on that straight street, you have no guarantee of making it to glory. Now, when God's calling you out of darkness into his marvelous light, guess what he'll do? He'll put you on that straight street. Now, when he puts you on that straight street, you're going to go from your former self to your new self. Now, your former self, quite interestingly enough, is just like the brother whose house Saul was in. His name was called Judas. Now, Judas is the brother that we actually use as a larger macro model of an opposition to Jesus. So isn't this interesting? Paul, whose name was Saul, who was an adversary of Christ, is put on a straight street, then put in Judas' house. And in Judas' house, he's on his knees praying. What is the Lord saying to us? God will allow all hell to break loose to get you on your knees so that you can go from being a Judas to being a Saul, a, a Paul, a man or woman of prayer. Because only a praying person will be able to make it through this crazy world. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? So what, 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 what Paul, what James is about to do is help us to understand this warfare that I really want you to get. And for some of you, you're not in that place. You're not in a battle right now. You're not waging war with any one person, any one entity, or any one group of people. So you can take this message and put it in your pocket. Because it'll show up for you in the future. But others of you, you are going through this battle right now. And something that I've said these last five minutes or so has resonated with you already. And I'm hoping you can track with me. If you can't track with me, get the message and do what? Listen to it ten times. Because sometimes in the preaching and teaching of God's word, listen to me, the message is not directly to you, it's indirectly to you. And other times the message may be directly to you, but your heart is not ready to receive it. So what you do is get that message and say, Lord, make this message mean something to me at the time when I'm right or when it's right. And so let's start right now with what I call James's observation. There are three things that are going on that's clear in chapter four. He gives a clear assessment in verses one through four of what's going on. An assessment is when you go, uh-huh, I see. James gives a clear assessment. He says in verses 1 through 3, and that's where I'll stop for the moment, from where do wars and fightings among you come? Do they not come from this place? 
your lusts that war in your members. Then he says, you lust and have not, you kill and desire to have, and you cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. Verse 3, you are asking and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you might consume it upon your lust. Talking about getting into somebody's business. Talking about a pastor getting right into their business, pulling the curtains back and letting everybody know what's going on. This is what we call an assessment. James has assessed the practical outworkings of chapters 1, 2, and 3. Remember chapter 3? The tongue was crazy, right? Set on course of hell, fire everywhere, right? Two kinds of wisdoms, the wisdom from above and the wisdom from below. And James is saying, unless that tongue is tamed, it'll destroy everything. Now what James is doing in chapter 4 is showing us the practical outworkings of an undisciplined tongue. And what he does is open up the curtains and shows us what I am calling the field of battle. The realm of conflict. And it's a conflict between church members in this context. And I am inferring from what James is doing, and he will... Sh he will affirm what I am inferring is that we are dealing with two categories of people in the church, wheat and tares. That's a sad reality, but it occurs. And sometimes where you and I don't make an accurate diagnosis of the problem, we go around scratching our heads forever because we're trying to figure out what's going on. And what James wants us to know is you can't do what he was talking about in chapter 1, 2, and 3 without there being a conflict of natures. So I want us to get into this because I want us to work this through. And again, if I really wanted to, I could have given a more practical title germane to our outline, and it would simply be friendship with the world is enmity against God. So let's see if we can work this through. Again, this is very important. Verses 1 through 4 gives us an assessment. Verses 5 gives us what we call a critical diagnosis. I just stated that. 5 and 6, do you think that the scriptures speak in vain when it says the spirit that dwells in us, what? Lusts to envy? Now that needs explaining, doesn't it? And we'll do that next week. And after James gives a very clear diagnosis of the problem, which needs explaining, here's what he does. He then begins to move into what he calls a remedy and solution to the issue. And that's verses 6 through 10, of which I won't go over again because I want to develop that next week. Essentially, what James says is what I've shared with this church for many years now. If you are not praying, you are fighting. If you are not praying, you are fighting. When you join the Lord's team, when you become part of his army, when you join our Lord's school of discipline, the one thing you are going to learn to do or you're going to fail every time is this. He's going to teach you how to pray. He's going to teach you how to pray. Didn't we just learn that just upon the conversion of the apostle Paul, that the first thing we see him doing is hitting his knees. And I would suggest to you that a lot of our problems are sustained and um, uh, increase and become insurmountable because we really don't hit our knees. Am I making some sense? All right. So what James does is opens up chapter 4 and lets us know something that's awful that's taking place and we've got to deal with it. Here in our outline, our first point is very clear. Here's what he says under point number 1. The fire that sustains the war is what? The fire that sustains this war is lust. He's shown us that fire in chapter 3, but I want to deal with it more particularly. Under point number 1, then, there are a couple of sub-points that I want to make very clear in our outline. Point number 1 is, it's in every man. What are you talking about, Pastor? This lust. This lust. It's in every man. It's in every human being. We all have lust. Now, lust is a fundamental characteristic of our human makeup because God has given us what we call drive. Aspiration to live, aspiration to thrive, aspiration to prosper. But it's called lust in the Bible, epithemia. But that term lust in verse 1 really has to do with a fault that takes place in us when we 
become sinners. It's the Greek term hedonism. Have you ever heard of it? You know what a hedon is? Not heathen. Hedon. Hedonism is an old Epicurean term that means you are driven by a lust for pleasure. And so here's what James is saying. There are those who have at the center of their life nothing but pleasure as their goal and objective. And because they're driven by mere pleasure, their pleasure is their worldview. Their desire to fulfill their hedonistic aspirations is what rule them. And because pleasure is their chief goal, watch this now, everything else is subordinate to it. And they'll go to war like I don't know what until they achieve their goal. Now you need to know that because here is something that you and I have to ask. When we work with people and live with people and... and uh, engage with people, if we both start off with the same worldview, let's say God is at the center of our life, but then one day inadvertently without them even letting you know, they didn't shift their worldviews. And they didn't went from God being the center and core of their, of their life to watch this now, money. Do you know you're going to wake up one day and be at war with that person? Because their worldview has just shifted. It's just changed. Or let's say a couple is together and they both start off saying, we love the Lord, right? Matthew 6, 33, going to seek the kingdom. Then one person works up, wakes up one day and says, you know what? It's all about me. Now, all of a sudden, self becomes the center of attention, the focus of their existence. We call it narcissism. And that self-narcissism may manifest itself in many things. Here's my point. The other person who is operating out of a different worldview is going to be awfully surprised when the individual that they are assuming is operating on the same worldview is going down a different course than you. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? But here's what James is saying. Every one of us is driven by a lust, and that lust is neutral in itself, but it must be informed and governed by other, other principles. Now here's the thing about James you need to know. In chapter 4, he's talking to us as a group. It's in what we call the plural form, okay? He's talking to y'all, us, church folk, y'all. In chapter 1, he was speaking to us individually. In chapter 1, he had narrowed it down to any man. He says, if any man, any man, he says in James 1.14, remember, every man is drawn away by his own what? And being enticed, he is led into a pattern of sin that leads to his destruction. Is that what James 1.14 says? James 1.14, just pull it up. I need you to see that just to affirm it in your head so you can see the connection between where James is now and where he's going. And this proposition may not be important to you, but it is. He says, every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. And when sin is done, it brings forth what? Right. So 14 and 15 of James chapter 1 describes what they call in the, the world of fishermen, a bait being set for a fish. Now watch this. When you know how to fish and you know the nature of a fish, you know what kind of bait to cast into the water, what kind of lure to put in that water. And when you put the right lure in the water, listen to me, the nature of that fish automatically pursues the lure. What's in that fish is a DNA that drives him in a lust for that lure. He cannot help himself. He cannot help himself. And so once he goes after that bait and bites it, now he's taken in by the fisherman. And what James says is, when you and I are not operating out of biblical principles, there's a natural tendency in us to be driven by our lust, to be taken in by something. And once our lust has bitten the bait, we are hooked. And now we're going on a long excursion as a slave to some system, some person, or something. Am I making some sense? So James starts off in the Bible telling us that's how the whole human race fell. That's how the whole human race fell. Remember, Satan was the great fisherman. He came in the person of the serpent and he cast that lure out at Eve. And he said to Eve, you can be just like God. He knew intrinsically there was the capacity for Adam and Eve to want to usurp God's authority. She bit the bait, didn't she? She bit the bait. And from then on, we have all been struggling with wanting to be like God. Wanting to walk in our own autonomy, wanting to be our own boss, wanting no one to tell us what to do, no one to control us, no one at all. You see this in the seeds of little kids, don't you? 
They ain't here but three days. And they're waging war against mama and daddy. You little serpent, you. Right? Right, and you, and, you, and you know, you know what's going on. We've been saying it for many, many years in our reform circles, little bitty vipers and theological diapers, right? And we've been saying it for a long time because it's true. And so parents have to manage the fallen nature of their child. We have to manage our own fallen nature. What I am talking about that James is setting up for us is an explanation why what should really be a harmonious, cogent, coherent relationship of amenable and cooperative uh, 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 participation on the part of people groups, whether it's a couple or whether it's a job or whether it's a team, etc. The reason why it fails to be so is because people are driven by individual passions and lusts that set them against one another. Are you guys hearing what I'm saying? And until you identify that as the core problem, you're going to be scratching your head wondering why it is that we can have the same last name but don't act alike. Or why it is we can have the same physical DNA but act totally contrary to one another. Two different worldviews. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? That's point number one. So there's uh, two sub points I want to quickly walk through with that. Our first sub point we've already acknowledged. It is in every man. The second one, it started with the what? First family. That's why I quoted Genesis 3.6. Look at Genesis 3.6 briefly to mark what I'm getting at in terms of James' assessment before we move on. In Genesis 3.6, quite interestingly enough, it gives us insight into the nature of lusts or passion or drives lack of intelligence. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, it says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for what? And that it was pleasant to the what? And that it was a tree to do what? She sinned. Is that what it says? She took and ate of it, right? Now, ladies and gentlemen, she had already seen the tree for how, who knows how long. But on this day, this tree looked different to her now than it did the day before. Because the tree now is draped in a proposition that has been strategically laid by a serpent that she didn't recognize was an enemy, which changed her whole view of the tree. What she saw the tree as before was a tree that her God said, leave alone, you got plenty. Now she sees this tree as a tree that she's got to have or else she won't be all that she's supposed to be. Now, how did that happen? The enemy was able to impose a proposition that changed her whole worldview in a split second. This set her up to be at war with both God and man. That's what our text is talking about. Are you guys hearing me? That's what our text is talking about. And I just want you to get that. Now, what I have stated to you before about James, and I'm glad there are many of you in the house who know that you have to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord, and therefore you're patient with Bible study because you're not going to get microwave messages here. Right? So you know that we take our time and work through the Word of God because we want God to speak to our soul, right? So he opens the scriptures up to us little by little and shows us the greater clarity of his word. We call it revelation, right? So I told you James chapter 1 and 2 is James speaking first and foremost to the men of the church because they were the leaders and he was holding them accountable for being authentic leaders. Therefore, he spoke in what we call the third person singular or the second person singular, you are them. And it was men. By the time he gets to chapter 4, he said, now I'm going to talk to the whole congregation because I've laid out my argument. You guys got a real problem, and here it is. Some of you are saved and some of you are not. So he, he's just being honest right about now. Can, can, I, can, I, can I help you? He's just being honest. And then he's backing up and affirming his honesty by saying, if I sit on the sidelines of this uh, auditorium and watch you guys in your hearts and in your behavior, you're killing one another. Now, how can two walk together except they be agreed? So all James is saying is you guys got a way bigger problem than what translation of the Bible you hold. Your division is not because you want to use the ESV or the NIV or the NASV versus the KGV or the NKGV. None of those letters got anything to do with your twisted heart. Am I making some sense? Right, so it's important for you to know this. That when war is existing in the sphere of your dwelling, you have to find out who changed teams even though they kept the same uniform on. 
This is what we're dealing with here, and I want you to get it. So in Genesis 3, you have the lens focused on one man, one woman, Adam and Eve. But the same dynamic took place by the time we get to Genesis chapter 6, verse 2. Now that we've got maybe millions of people on the earth created in Adam and Eve's image. Look at Genesis chapter 6, verse 2. In that day, the sons of God saw the daughters of men. They're doing the same thing Eve did. She was looking at the tree. She was looking at the wrong thing. They're looking at the wrong thing too. Because the sons of God should be looking at daughters of God. No pun intended. D-O-G. All right. Uh, but, but, but they're looking at the daughters of men and they saw that the daughters of men were what? That's the same construction in Genesis chapter 3 verse 6 intentionally to show us that the temptation has magnified from two people to the whole human race. And this is what's going on in James 1, 2, and 3 as we get to chapter 4. We're dealing with the larger context now. And notice how it goes. It says, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Now, those of you who know your Bible, you know your Bible sets boundaries by God for our good on every level of life, right? I don't get to just go take a woman and have my way. Is that right? Well, I don't hear a real amen from the brothers in the house. <laughs> Right, so just stay with me for a moment. We don't just get to do that. And a sister go, doesn't get to just go have any kind of man they want and have their way. God has set up boundaries for our good. When we break those boundaries, we are waging war against God and everyone who is on God's side. And that's where we are in our text, and it's very important for you to see that. So our text is expanded that way. That's point number one. It's extremely important. Going back to James chapter 4 then, I do want to press this home. When James uses the very technical language of war and fighting and lust, as he does in verse 1 and 2, of wars and fightings and lust, he is very technical in the terminology. The word wars there in James 1.1 1, 1 is the word from which we get the term polemics. Now, what is a polemic? A polemic is a diatribe of words, hostile, conflicting, antagonistic words of one person against another. When you are in a polemical mode against somebody, you are angry with them and you build arguments against them. That's all you do in your mind. You find grievances and faults. And you find ways to make them wrong and you want to destroy them. That's what polemics is. And vice versa. He says, where are the polemics at? What is the grounds of your fighting? Because the polemic is on the inside. The fighting is on the outside. Interestingly enough, that word fighting there, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Fightings among you? That's the external manifestation of the internal dynamic. Are y'all following me so far? What, where, where are the fightings? What does he mean by fightings? The word fighting in our English is the word strategies. It's a military term for exercising the kind of strategic intelligence that's needed to get yourself in a position where you can take advantage of your foe. So the fighting will be an intelligentsia. It will be a, uh, a, a, a strategy. It will be a methodology by which you get yourself in a position to win the battle. You're fighting, aren't you? You're fighting. From whence do these wars and fightings come among you? And then he says, they come of your hedonism. Amazing. Stay with me because, see, I've been floored. I'm really on the floor right now in my spirit. I've been this way for over a week as I've been working through the text. I'm floored because actually what James is explaining to us is everything but what a real Christian is supposed to be. He's actually explaining to us how people of the world act. He says that it's their hedonism that drives them to strategically take advantage of people and overcome people because they operate out of a worldview of polemics against everything that's against them. You guys got that? That's what James is saying. So what I want you to capture is this. It is very important for your worldview to be right if you're going to live in peace and harmony with people you're supposed to live in peace and harmony with. If you don't have a worldview that's consistent with that person you're living with, you can never walk in agreement. Do you guys hear what I'm saying? This is extremely important for church folk. It's extremely important for married folk. You guys have to figure out if you're married, what worldviews you hold. Didn't I talk about that in our marriage class? When we went into the second category of marriage, I talked about faith, then I talked about principle, and I said to the young couples, if you marry that brother or that sister, and you two have two different worldviews, 
All you're doing is marrying a fight. If your primary objective is this and hers is that, it's going to be war all over the place. Am I making some sense? You have to have priorities that are consistent or at least accommodating of each other in order for you to live in covenant. And it's true of the people of God too. Where some of us are walking carnally and others of us are walking spiritually, we cannot be at peace with one another. And that's exactly what he is dealing with here in our text. So then let's begin to move forward into our second point. Our second point says the lack and dissatisfaction that comes from what? Now, I take that from verse 2 and 3. If you notice what it says, you are lusting and you do not possess. You are killing and you desire to have and you cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not because you are not asking. You're taking. You're demanding. You're pushing and shoving. You're manipulating and controlling. You're strategically positioning yourself for advantage. You guys got that? He says, you're not actually talking to God about the problems in your life, because if you were talking to God about the problems in your life, he would give you a different methodology. He would show you how to solve that problem in a way that glorifies him. But really what you are doing is you are protecting your idol, and your idol is your hedonism. Your idol is your lust. It's the chief goal in your life. Remember, we learned that, right? Verse 1. What's driving you? Your hedonism. If, if pleasure is the chief goal for which you exist, you will do just about anything to achieve it. And anyone that would stop you from doing it becomes necessarily your what? Enemy. How many of you guys are with me so far? Raise your hand if you're with me so far. See, now, if you've been in the world for 10 minutes, you know what I'm saying is true. You may not like what I'm saying, but what James is doing for you and me is helping us do a real heat check on whether or not we are operating out of Christian principles or not. That's all he's doing is giving us a heat check. He's just being honest with us. James is being, he's just one of the few honest pastors in the world. He's being honest with us to help us understand that you can't call yourself living in and existing with and enjoying the favor of God when your worldview is contrary to God. That's verse 6. Friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God. He, he's he's kind of making it plain. And I'm going to build it up for you so you can see it before we close out today. So under point number two, my argument is that the lack and dissatisfaction that occurs when you are driven by your desires and driven by your lust, and you will kill. Now, ladies and gentlemen, killing in the Bible carries many, uh, many metaphors, doesn't it? Many analogies, many dimensions. Physically killing is not the first and foremost of what James is talking about. Can a man kill somebody with his words? Can a man kill somebody with innuendos? Can you and I kill somebody with our motive and intent? Of course we can. Jesus said, if a person is angry with another person in their heart, they have procured the fires of murder. If you and I are angry with an individual in our heart and we do not have a righteous grounds in order to be angry with them, we better be careful because our anger could lead to murder. Now, of course, what James is doing is maintaining his argument as it is attached to what I've already sta stated to you before is nothing but the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Jesus. Jesus did public ministry for three and a half years, didn't he? And for those of you who are with me in the Friday study, didn't we learn that God in his gracious love takes his people and he hides them in the dirt and covers the dirt over his precious jewels until he has matured us. And when he has matured us, then he brings us forth as a showing. But when he brings us forth as a showing, he then has called us into the huios or the fellowship of his suffering, knowing that once we start bearing record to the glory of God, that at any point our testimony can end and they're going to do what? Kill us. So John the Baptist had three and a half years with those knuckleheads. What did they do to him? The Lord Jesus had another three and a half years with those knuckleheads. What did they do? They killed him. And before they killed him, they slandered him. They ridiculed him. They lied on him. They were polemic against him. They were doing everything that James is unpacking before us. Can you guys see that? You want to see you how, show you how coherent the word of God is. All James is doing is recollecting what happened in the days when he was unregenerate while they were seeking to kill his brother. He's saying, whoa, 
The same context then is now. This is why he could see it so well. Because see, before God saved him, he agreed with those who killed his brother, the Lord Jesus. He heard their carping arguments behind the closed doors. He heard their exaggerations and their distortion and their out and out lies about Jesus. He heard how they twisted Jesus' words and made Jesus guilty of things that Jesus never ever said. Are you guys hearing what I'm saying? And that's what happens when you are driven by your lust. So by way of application, before we move to our third point, you better ask yourself, when you are motivated and you are driven, what's driving me? You better ask yourself, because every one of your drives and aspirations is not necessarily the will of God. Now, and you get a chance to test that query by not only asking yourself, what's driving me? But how am I acting in light of that drive? Is my behavior in light of that drive manifesting very terrible behavior patterns or practices that basically correspond to the unregenerate man who doesn't know God? Am I knocking people down on my way to the top? Am I pushing people over on my way to a position of favor and prominence and, and accolades? Am I doing all that the natural man does in order for me to achieve that goal? If I am, I am not acting Christianly. Are you guys hearing what I'm saying? And I have completely abandoned Proverbs 3, 5. And I have completely abandoned Psalm 37. And I've completely abandoned Psalm 1. And some of y'all know it because you read your Bibles. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto, unto your own understanding, but in all your ways do what? When you're driven by your hedonistic passions, you're not acknowledging God at all. Your knees are rough as alligators from not hitting the ground. From not hitting the ground, right? You guys know what I'm saying is true. When you exhaust yourself intellectually and mentally to simply strategically set yourself up to achieve goals, even at the destruction of others. This is what James is describing, and I'm going to show you here in a moment that that's fundamentally the case. So what does James say? In God's mercy, here's what he does, at least to the believer. When the believer is operating out of principles that are carnal and not right, God keeps you in a constant state of dissatisfaction. Stay with me. If God loves you, he won't let you be satisfied with the way you are behaving. If God loves you, he will not let you be satisfied with the way you're behaving. At best, you will spend most of your time hiding from God, hiding from his word, hiding from his providence, hiding from his care. Because while you're not walking in the light and walking in darkness, there's a kind of comfort there, but not to your conscience. In your conscience, you know that you're not walking in the favor of God. You know you're not walking in the blessing of God. You know you're not walking in the approval of God. It is a magnificently different experience when we are in the will of God and when we are not. Are you guys hearing what I'm saying? And so what James is helping us understand is if God loves you, he'll do what? Resist you. And again, I'm going to talk about that next week because he gives us the remedy. I'll talk about it here in a moment. He gives us the remedy to our enmity against him. But notice what it says under point number two. The lack and dissatisfaction that comes with from not asking God. Now, there are two things I want to state about that. Because James anticipates you coming back and saying, but I pray. <laughs> he anticipates that because we're religious folk. We'll tip our hat to God for about 10 seconds, won't we? And then we're going on about our business. And what James says and what the psalmist says and what the Lord Jesus says is that is not prayer. What James says, what the Lord Jesus says, what the psalmist says, and what Job says, is that's not prayer. That's a pretense. And so I want you to see this in our second sub, our first sub point. The faulty confidence of what? The human will. Do you see that? The faulty confidence of the human will. Is it possible as a carnal Christian or a hedonistically driven professing Christian to be so controlled by your own will and volition that you go to God in hypocrisy, asking God to do something for you, never ever once contemplating yielding your will to him so that if he says no, you are willing to live with that. 
Is it possible to be that kind of person in prayer where it's a foregone conclusion? You doing your will. You just want God to sign off on it. Right. So listen to what the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 9. I want to quote these four verses, but I want them to be pulled up because I want you to see them. These are verses I learned in my heart many, many years ago. Here's what God says in 1 Samuel 2, 9. He will keep the feet of his saints. Is that a good promise? For some of you need to mark that down. Because sometimes we get into really, 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 really bad trouble. And I need God to deliver me from me. Because I'm about to slip. Right. And the wicked shall be silent in darkness. Deliver me from that second clause. Because that's what happens when you are in disobedience with God. He cuts the lights out. You get no biblical revelation. You get no inter internal illumination. You get no confidence in terms of God's providence in your life on the everyday course. You don't, God stops talking to you when you and I are in disobedience. Am I making some sense? Now look at line number three. For by strength, do you see that word strength? You can use that word to apply it to your own human will. Our wills are something, isn't it? Our wills are something because it's the will, it's the desire, it's the volition that drives you in your choices of what you do. Check your will. Check your will. Check to see if your will is in compliance with God's will because if it's not, God takes no pleasure in it. Do you see it? God takes no pleasure in the strength of a man. Do you see that? God takes no pleasure. For by strength shall no man what? Right. So please understand this. Your will will not be done. <clears throat> and, and let me get that across. Your will will not be done. Last time I checked, you didn't exist all by yourself apart from nothing. Last time I checked, you didn't create the heavens and the earth and all things that are therein. Last time I checked, you don't uphold all things by the word of your power. Last time I checked. Last time I checked, your breath is still in your nostrils. You borrowed it, and one day you're going to breathe the last breath. Last time I checked. So stay with me now. Here's what God is saying to you and me. And this is a loving statement. This is loving. This is loving. God knows when you're outside of his will, you're at war with him. He knows that. And he's letting you know that, brother, you're not going to win. Your last name ain't going to never be Jehovah. Right. right, it's important for us to get that. And so by strength shall no man prevail. Let's look at Psalm uh, 147, verse 10. Psalm 147, verse 10 and 11. I want you to see verse 10. Are we there? Psalm 147, verse 10. Get this because this is a promise too. God delights not in the strength of a what? He takes no pleasure in the what? Do you see it? The leg is the metaphor of the most strong part of your body. You guys know once we lose our legs, it's over with. You care how much upper strength you have. If you don't have thighs and legs, it's over with. God takes no pleasure in the legs of a man. Do you know why? Because the legs represent his will. Our feet are swift to run to destruction, to commit violence. We use our bodies as instruments of war against the will of God. So God takes no pleasure in the legs of a man when a man is using his legs as messengers of his rebel will against God. You guys got that? Does that make some sense? So see, what God is telling us in his word is, you might be a child of God, you might be born again, you might not, but if you are and you are at enmity, enmity with me, you're going to war against omnipotence. You can't win. We're getting ready to pull your ticket and get you out of here because you fail to understand why God left you here. You're supposed to be on God's team. Are you guys with me so far? All right, look at our second subpoint because it's critically important under our, our, our next verse, rather. I want to deal with verse 11. Look at verse 11. Go back, sweetheart. Verse 11, I think I didn't deal with it. The Lord takes pleasure in them that what? Rule. Is that good? Listen, is that good? The previous verse says, I take no pleasure in your strength. I take pleasure in them that fear me that reverence me, that adore me, that find all their hope in me, that depend upon me, that yield to me, submit to me as sovereign Lord. God takes pleasure in the person that says, God, I need you. I'm going to say it one more time. God takes pleasure in the person that says, God, I need you. That's who God takes pleasure in. 
That's Isaiah 57, verse 15. That's Isaiah chapter 46, 10 through 14. That's Matthew 6, 33. Many verses. The Lord who sits high looks low, sits upon the circus of the universe, looks for the broken and the contrite and the lowly and the humble to dwell with them. God loves to dwell with the man or the woman that says, I need you, God. Are you guys with me? This is very important to get. All right, let's deal with our second sub point under point number two so I can move on. Since we recognize that what's taking place in our text is the faulty confidence of the human will. And I really do want you as a child of God to make sure that you assess and identify when your will is simply in rebellion against God's. Because God, his name is called the Ancient of Days. I'll give you one more point on that. So I got about 10, 15 minutes with you guys. You know what? God will take his time tearing you down. He will order a latte with three shots, a couple bagels, take a bite, have a sip, touch you. Watch you scream and holler. And we already learned in the last night men's meeting that God don't care about your hollering because he didn't already pay for you if you're his. You're going to glory, but you're going to glorify him going to glory. He'll let you act a fool a little bit longer. He'll let you act a fool a little bit longer. He'll have another sip of coffee and another bite of the bagel. And then he'll touch you again. And something else collapses in your life. And, and while he's doing that, he's blessing other people who are watching you in your wickedness. And say, hmm, I see that I can't win with God that way. Lord, keep me from acting like him. Uh huh. So, so sometimes that's what God does. He will allow your erring brother or sister to be a model for you so you won't do it. Or a family member. Or a relative. And that's actually going to exacerbate the issue because you're learning and they're not. So you got to go a different way than they go because they are still hardened in their heart. They're still trusting in the power of their own will. They're crafting out a new thesis. God loves me, God loves me, God loves me. Yeah, well, he may love you, but he's going to kill you <laughs> before he lets you have his last name in rebellion against him. Does that make some sense? Yeah. Right, he'll kill you. He'll let you get sick. He'll cripple you. He'll give you all kind of anxieties, and, and the next thing you know, you just messed up. You messed up. You just messed up. And you're trying to figure out what it is. And if God loves you, he'll let somebody that's been tracking with you, watching you from the start, tell you, go back to point A, you'll find out what it is. But sometimes he won't even allow you to have that person because they get so far away from you that you just got to wait on the Lord to reveal what he said to the church at Ephesus, start your first works all over again. That's where you'll find me. Go back to the beginning. Go back to where you stop praying, where you stop reading, where you stop doing your Bible study, where you stop earnestly seeking God. That's where you'll find me. You guys following me so far? Can I keep talking? So here's the second sub point. It's almost the same as the first, but not quite. So the faulty confidence of the human will is where Christians get in trouble and where um, um, unbelieving religionists get in pr trouble. But the second one is he's too proud to really, truly what? Right. This is a mystery, but it's so. I, I often, yeah, think about this for a moment. That's why I said the human will is anti-intellectual. The volition is anti-intellectual. It is not inherently wise. How can you be wise when you won't call on God? How can you be wise? I mean, that's the shortest definition of a fool you can get. I mean, you know, some of us are from the hood and we don't like real long sentences and elongated constructions and conjunctions and clauses. So we'll say the fool has said in his heart no to God. There it is. That's your definition. Whenever you say no to God, you're a fool. What is a wise man going to do? They're going to fear the Lord. They're going to depart from evil. They're going to ask the Lord for help. Is that right? Gonna, now think about that. You're a child of God like I am. You know those days when you are absolutely foolish? Don't you marvel at how hard your heart can be against God? And how you will not get on your knees and pray even though you see the house collapsing all around you. 
That's what I'm talking about. Psalm chapter 10, verse 4. Pull that up so my brothers and sisters can see that the Bible is sufficient to give us every knowledge necessary, every working knowledge, every wise working knowledge for us to do the will of God. The Bible is so adequate if we just let it talk to us. Most of the time we don't, but it is. Listen to what Psalm 10, verse 4 says. Are we there? The wicked, through the pride of his continence, see it, will not seek after God. Do you guys see that? The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. Watch this. God does not reign in his thoughts. In other words, if you, if you let God reign in your thoughts, you will seek him every day. If you let God reign in your thoughts, you're going to talk to God. You're going to commune with God. You're going to be honest with God. You're going to walk in the light. You're going to have fellowship with God. The blood of Jesus Christ is going to allow you to confess your sins, acknowledge your rebellion, and God's going to show you his favor. But when you and I are in rebellion against God, his thoughts run on the outer perimeter of our cranium in one ear and out the other. It never penetrates our soul. It never gets a grip on our intentions and our motive and our actions. It never really rules in our heart. Right? We hear it like an echo chamber. It goes in one ear and out the other. What rules is our will. And so long as that's happening, we don't see God. So you got Christians all over the place who know the big pink elephant in their house is that they don't pray. Let's go to point number three. Let's work this through. As we head our way to point number three, because I want to make sure we get this done here in a bit, I just want you to think this through. Think through how egregious it is that we don't pray. And think through the fact that we don't pray is because our human will is so strong and our proud, arrogant hearts are so impenetrate that we don't pray because prayer really admits and confesses that we are peasants. And a praying person has to pray as a peasant to a monarch. When you are a peasant, you pray to the monarch to pour out the benevolence of his kingdom and its goods and resources in your life because you are a peasant. You got that? And then we don't pray because we're guilty. And so a praying person that is guilty has to go to his judge and acknowledge to the judge, I'm guilty and ask for pardon. But pride won't let you ask for pardon. When pardon is in the hand of the judge who saved you. So you won't go to the monarch and you won't, listen, you won't go to the judge and you won't go to the doctor. You got a disease. And it's actually increasing like leprosy. Other people see it. You actually know intuitively it's there. And you won't ask for him to heal you, Jehovah Rapha. You won't ask for him to heal you. Because you're too proud. And it's debilitating you more and more and more and more and more. You won't pray to him as a son prays to his father for favor. Remember the prodigal son? Turned around. Came back home. Daddy, have mercy. I just want to be a servant in the household. Now think about what I just stated. A peasant to a monarch. A guilty criminal to his judge. A sick man to his doctor, a son to his father. Remember what James taught us. If any of this is going to get into our hearts, we've got to remember James 1.12. Blessed is the man that endures temptation. For when he has overcome his trials, he shall receive the crown of life. And all they also that love God. And remember James chapter 3 verse 2? Blessed is the prudent man who knows how to hold his tongue because in doing so, he's going to save the whole body. Now let's go to our last paradigm because our last paradigm is where James is anxiously headed to go starting in chapter 4. James chapter 5 verse 16, the, uh, the righteous man, the effectual and fervent prayers of the righteous man does what? Avails much. I can't wait to unpack that for you. It's amazing. I mean, we quote it all the time, but we don't understand that this brother is walking around with dynamite sticks all over his body, given to him by God. He can throw it at situations and blow it up and break through and enter into the promises of God simply because he believes God for the available and applied power that's given to him when he prays effectually. 
It's amazing. It's amazing. So what are we looking at? The Lord Jesus, right? Who persevered, who was prudent in his words, but he was a man of what? He was a man of what? Prayer. He was a man of what? Christ prevailed praying. Remember, they came to him and they, they said, are you a king? He says, yeah. And they said, well, where's your army? I says, my army is not of this world. If it were of this world, we would fight. But as a king teaching his servants how to win, he simply prayed. And see, this again is where the carnal, unregenerate person does not believe that prayer actually works. You know what kills me with Christians? I got a few more minutes. You know what kills me with Christians? When we talk about praying, I get this attitude by Christians, and it goes like this. Yeah, but. Have you ever heard it? I get this attitude from Christians. I'm not worried about the unsaved. I got that. The unsaved don't know the secret. The unsaved don't understand the blessing. The unsaved have not felt the power of prayer. I'm talking about the professing Christian that should have gone from a Saul to a Paul. Well, you hear these Christians go, yeah, but with prayer scares me to death. He at least ought to know that prayer is just God wanting you and him to talk. Point number three, then, as we wind this up, the praying that is not praying at all. Did I deal with that? Good. The praying that's not praying at all. It's almost redundant, so I'm just going to simply comment points, sub points A and B. Praying is what? Coming before God, which the hypocrite cannot do. You got that? Two verses. Job chapter 13, verse 16. I'm just giving you two. Job 13, 16. Listen to what Job says. He also shall be my salvation. This is Job speaking to his enemies because his enemies were saying God is against you because you're going through trouble. Nothing could be further from the truth for the child of God. But people on the outside will always say, you in trouble. Job says, no, I'm cool. <laughs> I'm cool. Well, watch this. He says, for a hypocrite shall not come before God. Do you see it? Now watch this. When Job got in trouble, what did Job do? He prayed. Do you remember chapter 1? Job lost his family. Job lost his house. Job lost his business. Job hit the ground. Job prayed. Job said, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's the Job we're talking about. Job starts off praying. Job ends up praying. And then God tells Job, you pray for the brothers who thought just because you went through all this hell that I was against you because they got it wrong. What was the key to Job's success? He was a praying man. That's one of the brothers that James is using as his argument in James chapter 4. Are you guys hearing me? Right. So, I say that, and our sub-point of point number three is this. The hypocrite does not come before God. God doesn't hear the hypocrite. Why? Because it's Hebrews 10, verse 22, that constitutes true prayer. And I want you to see it. Hebrews 10. I want to start at verse 19. Can you start me at verse 19? Because I want my brothers and sisters to get this. Now, when you are praying, you don't have to go anywhere. But I would advise that you do. Now, when you are a prayer person, you don't have to go anywhere, but I would advise that you do. I would advise that when you don't know how to pray, find somebody that knows how to pray to help you learn how to pray. Right. Because most people that don't know how to pray don't ever learn how to pray by themselves. So if you have been a Christian for a long time and you really don't know how to pray, it's because someone has not really taught you how to pray. You haven't been up against the model. What's my argument? It's the same person I always argue for, the Lord Jesus. <laughs> he took 12 men everywhere he went, and every day of his life, they learned that he was a praying man. The premise of our New Year's resolution, Lord, increase our faith, was prefaced upon them realizing that they didn't pray like he prayed. The first thing you got to learn is you don't pray like you ought to pray. And you don't know how to pray when you're not with people who know how to pray. You don't just wake up one day learning how to pray. That's humbling, though, when you got to go and get with somebody who knows how to get a hold of God and just sit there as a disciple and learn how to get a hold of God through them. But until you do it, you won't ever get a hold of God. 
not as you ought to. Are you guys hearing what I'm saying? No, I mean, you will pray when God hang, got you hanging off the side of the Bay Bridge because you fell asleep and the car's leaning over, tilting over, and you about to fall over into the bay and you forgot to learn how to swim. You said you was going to learn, but you, you, you delayed your learning how to swim. Now you hang it over the edge and the cameras are all on your channel two, channel four, channel five, and you praying there, Lord, Lord. If God has to do that to teach you how to pray, fine. 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 Whatever it takes. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus Christ, verse 20, listen to it, by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, verses 19 and 20 underscore the fact that we need a mediator to get to God. Look at this verse, look at this verse. By a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, verse 21, here it is. And having a high priest over the house of God, so we get to come to God through Jesus. Look at verse 22. This is the key to real prayer. Are you there? Look at it. Look at verse 22. Let us draw near with a what kind of heart? Quit playing games with God. In full assurance of what? Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed from pure, well, with pure water. What the Hebrew writer is saying is if you are a Christian, you've been born again. God's given you a new nature. He's taken out the stony heart, put in a heart of flesh. He's written his laws on your heart. He sprinkled you clean by the blood of Christ so that you have access to the Father. That's the way you come. You come as an honest, redeemed sinner saying, God, I am a mess, but I'm your mess. And I need you to help me with my mess because I can't fix my mess without you. Got it? Do you got it? Simple, not hard. This is a beautiful, just a, a basic introductory to prayer. See, because you got to come honestly, according to Matthew 15, Jesus says they, they cry to God with their mouth, but their hearts are far from him. So, so that's the problem we got going on here in the book of James as we get ready to wind it down. What is the problem? They're fighting. They're fighting. Let's go back to our text and close. I'm done here for today and we'll pick it up tomorrow. So there is a, tomorrow, next Sunday. <laughs> well, I don't know. I might talk about it on my Monday program. You never know. <laughs> the praying that is not praying at all is praying coming to God uh, before God, which the hypocrites can do. And the second one is he's living a lie. Uh, while we're going to point number four, the living a lie is operating out of the principle of uh, loving two masters. Are you at James chapter 4? James chapter 4, I want to show you what James wants to lead us to. Look at verses 13 through 17. I'm going to give you a contextualization, and then we're going to ready, get ready to shut it down. Here's, here is the people that James is talking about. Remember we already stated that James has told us that friendship with the world is enmity against God, that you actually can't have God's favor and love while you are actually loving this world system? Big problem for Christians today. Here's what James is describing as the people that he's having a problem with. Verse 13 says, Go to now, you that say today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such city and continue a year and buy and sell and get gain. Do you see it? Yeah. Know who he's talking to? The businessman that's pursuing wealth based upon a strategy of income acquisition that doesn't take into account that he needs God. He calls himself a Christian, but he really doesn't pray. His confidence does not lie in God opening doors and shutting doors. That God gives favor, that God restrains favor. That God opens the heavens and pours out blessings upon his people. That's not his confidence. His confidence is, is his, in his business degree. It's in his partners. It's in his carnal assumption that the power of his will can make him wealthy. Are you hearing me? This is the carnal Christian man who is the businessman who can get it done without God. Now, he'll stand up at the podium where it doesn't cost him anything and say, thank you, Jesus. But where it costs him, he'll keep the Jesus card in his pocket. And on his way to success, he will try underfoot every authentic believer trying to tell him you need God while you're going that way. Are you guys hearing what I'm saying? These are the people to whom James is speaking. And just to contextualize it a little bit more, these are the same Jewish people that Jesus says... What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Same people. Same people that Jesus says, hey, wheresoever your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Same people. Got it? 
This is the individual who walks oxymoronically saying, I'm a believer in Christ, but there's nothing in their life that indicates they truly believe. And then when you put that kind of person in the room with a real Christian, they butt heads. Why? Two different worldviews. Are you guys with me? Right, this is a real problem for the professing Christian who lives in a context, context of this kind of war. Almost done. So then we are moving to uh, point number four because these verses in chapter uh, four are very explicit and clear. Love for the world requires hatred for God. Do you see it? You guys got that? This is going to be my last point. And it's pretty self-explanatory. Look what uh, James says in verse four, and then uh, I'm going to explain it briefly and we're going to shut it down with a final uh, sort of mandate by, by James. You adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? That couldn't be any clearer, could it? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the what of God? Christian, get that verse, own it, and make it a frame for a mirror so you can look into it. Because you're going to have to ask yourself the question right along with me. Do I love this world? You're going to have to ask that question. Because that question is going to be the key to whether or not you actually have a real relationship with Christ or not. Because God is honest with you. He's letting you know, if you love this world system, you don't have my love. He's letting us know that. Are you guys with me so far? So again, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16, you guys have heard it before. All that's in the world is the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. It's not of the Father, it's of the world. The world's passing away. And they that love it will pass away with it. And this is where the conflict occurs in the life of professing Christians who actually have a greater love for the world than they do for Christ. That's where the internal conflict comes in at. And then the polemic against other believers who will say, hey man, we really ought to be prioritizing our walk with God. Am I making some sense? Right. And so this is what James is dealing with here himself as he says it in verse uh, 4. And think about what James has just done. He's called us adulterers, didn't he? That's cold. Every now and then I get the news around here, man, Pastor Hard. Pastor Hard, you should have heard me 10 years ago. Tell them, saints, 10 years ago I was like John the Baptist. Fine, bring. was I something 10 years ago? I'm much nicer now. Wave your, hand, wave your hand if I'm good. I'm much nicer now. Only a few people raise their hand. I'm much nicer now. Am I much nicer now? Ten years ago, boy, I was, I was burning you up without any mercy trying to get you saved. Um, but notice what James is calling us. See, he, he can deal in the commodity of truth because he's serious about eternity. He just has now pulled the curtains back and put a tag on it, didn't he? Pulled the curtains back, showed us how we fight and argue and are carnal and selfish, and then he put a tag on it. You guys are adulterers. Now, who are your adulterers against? God. So he reaches back into the Torah, the Tanakh, and he tags us with the prophetic emblem of having a professed love for God, but loving this world. You guys got it? You guys know that's a horrible thing. In the Old Testament, the consequences of adultery was what? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So under that final point, notice what it says. Love for the world requires hatred for God. I thought this was quite fascinating. Look at Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 25. And then I'm going to read 31 through 35 and explain it. And I'm going home. I don't know where you're going. Jeremiah 2. 25. Are you there? Listen to what God says. See, he's speaking to Jeremiah. He's already called them uh, 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 treacherous, having forsaken the fountain of living waters and, and hewing out for them uh, uh, cisterns that can hold no water. He says in verse 25, withhold your foot from being unshod. In other words, keep your shoes on and your throat from thirst. In other words, stop lusting. But you said, no, there's no hope for I have loved do you see it? Strangers, and after them I will go. See, the picture is that of a husband arguing with his wife to tell her to stay home. But she's already engaging in sexual liaison 
with another lover. And the cat's out of the bag now. And he's saying to her, don't, don't leave, stay here. And she's headed out. She says, there's no hope for us. I'm going to my other lovers. You guys got that? Listen, for I have loved strangers and after them will I go. Verse 26. We can already run with this. As the thief is ashamed when he is found, so is the house of Israel ashamed. They, their kings, their princes, and their priests, and their prophets. Why? Because they all were doing it. They were all were committing idolatry, which is adultery. Verse 28. I'm sorry, verse 27. You did that. Go to verse 27. Saying to a stock, you are my father. And to a stone, you brought me forth. Can you imagine how insane you have to be to bow down to a stone or a tree and say, you made me, you brought me forth? Can you see how reprobate Israel had to be to go from the true and the living God who delivered them out of Egypt by an outstretched hand and a mighty arm to now while they're in the promised land in their father's house, in their husband's house, they're bowing down to a tree and a stock saying you are our gods. You see how you can lose your mind when you play church? Listen to what he says. For they have turned their back unto me and not their face. But in the time of their trouble, they will say, they will say arise and save us. 28, 28, 28. I want to run through this. But where are your gods that you have made for thee? Let them arise if they can save you in the time of trouble. I love the way God is. <laughs> so, sometimes it's all right to argue back. You want me to save you now? Save yourself. Go get your gods to save you now. Let's see if they can save you. You carved them out of wood. You took the chips and you made some hamburgers out of it. You polished that thing. You bowed down, called it your God. It can't lie. It can't do good. It can't do evil. Now let it pay your bills. I love it. Verse 29. Wherefore will you plead with me? You have transgressed against me, saith the Lord. Verse 30. In vain have I smitten your children. They received no correction. Your own sword have devoured your prophets like a destroying lion. This is terrible because God was chastening them and they still were not turning from their sin. I want you to see something Why though. Verse 31. Oh, generation, see the word of the Lord. Have I been a wilderness unto Israel? Answer is no. I've been a blessing to Israel. A land of darkness? No. I was a fire by night, a pillar of cloud by day. Wherefore say, my people, we are what? Circle that. That's where I'm stopping. I'm done right there. Because that's it. That's it. The prophet speaking by the Spirit of God in Jeremiah 700 years before James is saying the same thing that James is saying. James simply just puts the tag on it. You adulterers. You know what they just said? We rule ourselves. We're our own boss. Watch this. You don't tell me what to do. So I'm going to stay within the, 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 the marriage metaphor and close it down. I want to stay in the marriage metaphor and close it down. As painful as this may be, it just needs to be so. So when Christ died for you, he purchased you to be his bride. That means he's your husband and you're his wife. Now, when you're a biblical Christian, when you're a biblical Christian, you accept a biblical model of, of husbandry. But not this generation I live in. This generation I live in, don't mind the paper that says he's my husband. But virtually nothing else gets to exercise authority over that female. Virtually nothing else. Virtually nothing else in terms of the spirit of marriage actually shapes her life so that she shows herself to be a wife to that man. You ladies learned in our women's theology class what it means to be a husband. Three things. And God has not changed. It means for him to be Lord. That's why I say to these young girls, if you're, not re if you're not ready to have a Lord, don't get married. Did y'all get what I just stated? It means for him to be Lord, because that's what that Hebrew word means. He's Lord. That's the first thing that a husband is, is Lord. That, what that means? He runs the household. He provides for the household. He makes sure that the household is intact. He protects. He provides. He gives everything necessary for the household. So when trouble comes, they got to come to him. 
She can stay in the kitchen, stay in the bedroom, go, go shopping, whatever. Go to the Lord of the house. He's the one you got to talk to. That's a good benefit, isn't it? If you can ever find a brother that's willing to take on that role. <laughs> stay with me. The first thing is, is Lord. That's why Peter had no problem saying Sarah called him Lord. The second thing he is, he's the man. That's the Hebrew term. That's the Hebrew term. What that means is when you get married, you get married to a man. Do I need to expand? Okay. I will contract. And when you get married to a man, what that means is you go, he is my man. You know what that means? All of the manly attributes, predicates, characteristics that are entitled, uh, 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 entailed in that term, he's supposed to operate out of. You know what that means? She's supposed to have the security of his manhood. Now, she's a full woman, and he is not taking anything away from her womanhood, but she gets to enjoy her man. See, our folks was getting this right way back in slave days when we used to say, that's my man, right? We was getting it, back, getting it right long ago. He's Lord, he's my man, and he's the begetter in this household. Those are the three terms that constitute a biblical man in the Old Testament. A begetter, what does that mean? You're not having children without him. You have been privileged by God in the imago day that he made you to reduplicate his image in children, and that's to be done by your man and your Lord. So that when you reproduce the, the module day of children, that man and Lord is supposed to take care of those children while you train and nurture them. You guys understand what I just stated? Now watch this. Watch this. Israel said, we will not let you be our husband. Got it? You see it? We are our own Lord's. Does that describe where we are today? And when the Christian goes about doing whatever they want to do, any way they want to do it, with any kind of funky attitude they want to do it, guess what they're saying to the master? You know my husband. I just got your name. You know what James says to that church? You're fallen. He says there's only one remedy. That's verses 6 through 10. And it starts with prayer. And in that prayer, there are 10 imperatives. And we're going to look at all 10 imperatives, 10 mandates, 10 instructions. God loves us enough to let you know that when you fall, don't get up. Just turn over. Stay on your knees and go through all 10. And if you make it through nine, he will lift you up. He will restore you. He will bring you back to a place of favor and blessing because that's the purpose for which Christ died for you. He is able to restore. He's able to recover. He's able to rebuild. He's able to bring us back. Am I making some sense? All right, let's have the offering at this time and go home. Yeah.